You may wish to adjust the dial. You are currently tuned into the wrong station. A slack drizzle had come in off the fence, to paint the castle walls with moss and drip from the rust-rimmed kettle helmet of the man slouching at the parapet. It was cold, soaked, mildew spore spread dismal fingers through his woolen doublet by the minute, but he was numb to smells and numbness nowadays. It was always damp at Fencaster. It always smelled. He figured he'd be damp until he died, and when he did, his water-paled corpse would rot to slimy bones within the week. The rain began to thicken, and the sound of heavy drops was like pebbles pinging from his helmet. A movement in the fog below drew his eye, and for a fragment of a moment the guard almost came to life. But whatever he had hoped to see, he was disappointed. Some revelation... Some white doe or other wonder of the other world, some prodigy suggesting more to life than mere damp boredom. But it was just another drenched, dispirited man, slogging out of the rain slashed emptiness. The guard sank back into his slouch, his eyes redeadened, and he watched the stranger's approach not out of interest, but for lack of something else to look at. This stranger, as he emerged from the fog, was revealed to be tall and ugly, with lank black hair plastered down across a hatchet face. His shanks, mud slathered to the knee, were gangling. He looked like a scarecrow or carnival geek. His clothes were dark, dank rags, and besides the sword at his hip, he carried little else. He looked as though he hadn't had a decent meal in months. Pausing below the gate... The stranger glanced back at the way he'd come, at the dim suggestion of rain-blackened, grasping trees, at the endless veil of silver mist and fog. Then he turned to look up at the guard, shading his eyes from the rain with a thorn-scratched hand. "'Aren't you going to ask who goes there?' "'Eh, not much point,' said the guard. "'I know why you're here. Your kind been coming in all morning. Half of them look worse than you. "'What about the other half?' The guard showed yellow teeth in reply. Look worse than them. They'll be starting soon. I'd be in if I was you. With a grunt, the stranger bobbed his head and passed beneath the gate. Under that crumbling shadowed arch, he paused to savor a moment's peace from the endless pressure of the rain. Ahead of him, the castle's inner ward was a field of mud, and the keep itself a pillar of sweating rock and greenish slime. A dismal sight. It would have filled his heart with emptiness, but the emptiness was already packed tight. So, said a voice to his left, it's come to this, has it? He glanced over his shoulder and found the ghost was with him once again. She always appeared on the left, the sinister side, and even after all this time he was still taken aback by the sight of her. She was more beautiful than he remembered. Always. Her hair was dark and faintly curled, her brows like the rim of black volcanic sand at ocean's edge. She was dressed in colors of sunset and blush that jarred appallingly with this realm of rotten gray and black. It was only now and then, by the faint tilt of her head, that you could tell she was a ghost. 
It was only then you saw the shadow of the skull that lurked beneath her sun-blushed skin. <laughs> it has indeed come to this, he confirmed. And you're happy with this decision? Her coral lips bent up in a mocking little smile. Now that she was dead, there was always a cruel tinge to any phrase she spoke, and though her voice still sounded like dark, sweet wine upon his ears, he had come to find the banter exhausting. He shrugged. It's honest work? Well, it's work, anyway, depending on your definition. He walked past her, out from the shelter of the crumbling arch and into the driving rain. She reappeared ahead of him, on the left. But is this what you really want from your time on Earth? What I want is something to eat and a dry place to sleep. And for that, you choose a life of dismal violence? Well, what else am I good for? He had found that a tone of dry, tired irony was his only defense against her. Interesting question. But I don't suppose you'll live to learn the answer. He tried to come up with some clever response to this, but before he could, as always, she had gone, melted away to vapor and cold. He passed a slow hand through the empty air where she had stood. Even after all this time... The pain of guilt was a cold arrowhead between the ribs. The great hall of Fencaster was filled with low clamor, and its tessellated floors were caked with the courtyard's mud. Adventurers had been straggling in all morning, and now they sat in clumps and cliques, using the long oak tables as benches, the antique benches as footstools for their filthy boots. They were nearly a hundred strong by now. Dressed in sodden coats of buff or moldy brigandine, water dripped from the tips of rotting scabbards and from the rusted spikes of targe and steel cap. To contain this mob, a small troop of unimpressive guards stood fidgeting about the dais, where an empty throne sat, its dry wood peeling from the years. Silently, the stranger entered and took a seat alone at the dim back corner of the hall. But... He wasn't lucky enough to go unnoticed. Moments after he had taken this seat, a man cruised from the crowd like a shark in sun-warmed shallows. Making eye contact, he spread his arms as if recognizing a lifelong friend. But the stranger had never seen this person in his life, and wasn't thrilled to meet him now. The man's sandy hair and beard were thick with matted grease, his shaggy clothes were dark with crusted stains. And yet he seemed well-fed, a slabby build suggestive of a diet mainly meat. Below wide shoulders, he had windpipe-crushing hands, whose backs were scarred by many a struggling set of fingernails. Though he smiled, his eyes were always dark. The stranger responded to his greeting with a cautious nod. Taking this as invitation, the big man strolled toward him, Still smiling, drawing wary glances from the crowd. The handshake he offered was sand and rock. His smell was sour sweet and stale blood. Pleased to meet you, name of Shatha Ben. He had bludgeons hidden in his smile. Pleased to meet you, Shatha Ben. Let me guess, you're some kind of wandering swordsman, yeah? Cut up a dozen men without skipping a beat, eh? <laughs> no, uh, nothing like that. No? Oh, well, don't be modest now. Fine figure of a man like you must have some story. Are you magic? No. Maybe you can put a knife through a bird's eye 90 paces, something like that. Nothing like that either. Oh, said Ben, his eyes becoming darker still. Just a regular man looking to make a bit of coin. Is that what we're talking about? That's all we're talking about. Now Ben stepped close too close, and filled the stranger's face with meaty breath as he studied the sallow features there. Well, now, I think you might be protesting just a bit too much, eh? It makes me think you might be trying to hide something about yourself from your old friend Shatha Ben. Now, why would you do a thing like that, eh? Eh? Unless you had, uh... He swirled his hand, representing his search for the proper phrase. Ill intentions... He said at last, with a triumphant grin. You wouldn't have ill intentions now, would you, friend? 
Wouldn't be trying to pull a fast one on your old buddy Shaitha Ban, now would you? Trying to get him off his guard so you can get the jump on him someplace out there in those big dark woods, now, eh? There was hunger in his voice, and his eyes had gained a flat and hollow glitter. The stranger tried to act as though these threats weren't there. <laughs> if it was anyone else, sure. But my old friend Shaitha Ban? I wouldn't stand a chance. At this light response, a black and wild violence entered Shaitha's eyes, and the menace on the air became so thick that people twenty yards away could feel the small hairs rising on their necks and turn to look. But Shaitha was capricious. His affect flipped like a coin, and quite suddenly he was full of joyless laughter. Ha! <laughs> ah, oh, very good. He clapped the stranger on the shoulder. That's right, you wouldn't, my old friend. Say, what did you say your name was again? And don't say I didn't, because I heard that one before, eh? The stranger hesitated. Uh, Theo. Theo, eh? Ah, uh, but I suppose that's not your real name. <laughs> I suppose it isn't either. Well, it'll have to do anyway. Ben took a step backwards, grinning like a skull. Till we meet again, Theo, in the big dark woods. With that, he winked and wandered back into the crowd, which parted round him like minnows on the reef. A few moments later, trumpets blew, and the clamor of the crowd fell hushed. A pair of grayish heralds dressed in dim livery had appeared in the dais at the far end of the hall, and as the gathered adventurers turned to pay indifferent attention, these two began to drone in unison. All hail, Earl Sarkwive Dimmis Fen, heir to the most ancient, excellent, and worthy seat of Castle Fencaster, where the earls of Dimmis Fen have kept their ceaseless watch unweary through the trudge of ceaseless years, bold, noble, perfect in body and spirit, courageous in duty, dutiful in courage, defending the common folk from every threat since immemorial time and into eternity. As they spoke, an old man dragged himself across the dais and slumped into the peeling throne. His thin shoulders were weighed with dusty furs and threadbare velvet, and though he was accompanied by a much younger woman, he swatted her attempts to help him. The moment he was seated, however, he rounded on her and began to berate her in a sneering tone. I need a blanket. Call one! How many times do I have to tell you? Is this how you treat your ailing father? To let him freeze and catch his death a cold? Oh, but you'd probably love that, wouldn't you? To be rid of the old man, eh? To make free with his inheritance and waste it on your little fripperies. This tirade went on at some length, as Colwyn scrambled to bring her father furs and a brazier of coals to warm his feet. All the while, the two heralds were still reciting, their dull voices blending with their lords in... Doleful Antiphon. Several of the adventurers exchanged raised eyebrows. It wasn't an inspiring start to their quest. At last, Earl Sarkwide and his heralds had completed their harangues, and Colwyn, flushed with humiliation, had taken up a post behind her father's throne. The old man straightened in his seat, attempting a dignified and noble mien. Noble adventurers, I thank ye for responding to my call. It is good to know that the most ancient, excellent, and worthy earls of Dimnus Fen, who, and here he repeated almost verbatim the patter that his heralds had relayed, immemorial time and into eternity, can still find friends in this world to answer when they call in an hour of desperate need. He paused, as if waiting for the crowd to clap. What he got instead was a sudden spatter of rain from the hall's leaking roof, and a low chuckle from Shaitha Ban. A slight flush touched Sarkwide's powdery cheek, and he hurried along. <clears throat> no doubt you all know why you're here. It is a mission of mercy to spare the common folk, for a monster has appeared in Dimness Fen. The vile, ruthless, venomous, and execrable Lathworm. He spread his fingers, leaning forward for effect. 
Once more, the crowd treated him to a bored silence. Now, uh, this worm, for over a year now, has appeared from the swamps and fogs to slaughter cattle, ruin homes, and carry off the livelihood of decent folk. It is by divine providence alone that so few have died. But it can go on no longer. Somebody must kill the beast. At this emphatic phrase, an unexpected thing happened. Colwyn, the earl's daughter, covered her face and suddenly fled the hall. An awkward silence fell. Ignorant slut! The Earl muttered, but it was quiet enough that they could hear him at the back of the room. Shathaban was the first to break the silence. What's the reward? This to a general murmur of support. Yes, we wish to know. It was a young woman who now spoke, stepping from the crowd with a hooded entourage. She was dressed in all black, and one of her hands was skeletonized, the bones carbonized by some ancient heat. What do the excellent and most worthy earls of dimness fen offer for the creature's head? Offer? Reward? Sarkwide would have clutched at his pearls, but that he wore garnets instead. As I said, this is a mission of mercy, one that can hardly be expected to... Don't shit on my mom's tits and tell me it's breast milk, you fucking cheapskate. Sarkwide lapsed into a scandalized stupor. We know you're sitting on a pile of coin in that vault of yours. Everybody for a hundred miles knows about Sarkwide's hoard, and you expect us to do your dirty work for free? How... how dare you? As Sarkwide blustered, another adventurer... This one, a portly knight in rusted mail, spoke up from the crowd. My lord, you must understand that even those for whom honor is reward enough have yet expenses they must pay. And you must understand, you call us here expectant pay, Ban cut in. So if you're not going to give it, I figure we're within our rights to take it. A snarl of assent lifted from the adventurers. Sarkwide's pale eyes widened as he realized... Just how many armed and desperate people he had invited into his hall. Behind him, untried guards shared nervous glances. V very well, Sarkwide cried, his eyes darting. Whoever brings me the lathe worm's head will receive thirty pieces of Easterling silver. A round of derision rose in the crowd. You insult us! sneered the woman with a dead hand. Ten times as much would be a miserly offer. Three hundred, then. Sarkwide was struggling to be heard over the commotion. Surely three hundred would be reasonable. Yes, but, my lord, protested the knight in rusting armor, even that would be below the usual rate. Four hundred. Sarkwide's voice strained as the crowd bristled closer to the throne. I charge you more than that to spare your life, bawled Shathaban. Five hundred and my daughter's hand. A silence fell. Sarkwide's eyes were wide with panic. It was clear he'd instantly regretted the offer, but was too afraid to take it back. Five hundred silver pieces, and with it, his daughter, his heir, his inheritance. Near the back of the hall, Theo had been sitting in silence, letting his mind wander. He didn't care about the haggling. Three hundred or thirty pieces of silver were all the same to him. Anything to buy a bowl of soup and crust of bread. But this great and horrid offer drew his attention back. To trade a human being in exchange for the slaughter of another living thing. It was profane, and it depressed him. Yet, at this thought... A smug and choral presence flickered into being on his left, and he could feel the mocking smile of the ghost. She knew him well enough, though he ignored her. She knew he'd take the job. He'd done worse things for lower stakes than life and death. Well? shouted Zarkwine, finding his courage at last. Is that enough for you vultures? Go! Go! With trembling wrists, he pushed himself to his feet. Bring me back this creature's head and claim your 
damned reward, you scum. I tell you, go. And the adventurers went, chuckling and sneering at each other, and passing lewd murmurs back and forth. Sarkwide's insults didn't faze them. All they cared for was the prize. Alone and ahead of the group, Theo stepped out into the rain, down the hall's front steps of crumbling brick, and into the sea of ankle-deep mud. He'd only gone a few steps before someone whistled off to his left. It was the ghost, of course, leaning around one of the buttresses that supported Fencaster's slumping keep. She was wearing a smile he had sometimes seen her wear in life, a mischievous, complicit smile. It took him several heartbeats to decide whether or not to ignore her. Whatever little game she was playing, he wanted nothing to do with it. But, in life, he had never managed to walk away from her. And now, defeated, turning from his path, he found in death her power unchanged. She had vanished by the time he arrived, and reappeared as an apricot blur through the fog ahead. Behind him, the hall was belting out adventurers, and as the courtyard filled, Shaitaban leaped onto a rotten hay wain to hail the crowd. He was not alone. He had his own gang with him now, large, lean killers armed with leaden darts and messer knives. Listen, folks, I just wanted to make it clear, you know, that what we're looking at here is a dangerous quest. Real dangerous, you know. This worm, this lathe worm, it's a real perilous creature we're talking about, folks. It's a big risk going up against it out there in those big dark woods. And so, you know, as a humanist in that, what I'm saying is, it might be best if most of you went home. You know, leave it to the professionals and such. For your own sakes, cause you never know what could happen. Theo rounded the corner, leaving the man's voice behind. Here, the rain had slackened into a vague, persistent mist, and as he followed the ghost's sunrise glow under the high, desolate walls, under windows slitted like eyelids half-concealing empty orbs, he came to stand of gnarled, hideous oaks that pawed at an overgrown yew hedge. There, in the shade of the oak's rusted leaves, he found the ghost crouched by a gap in the hedge, grinning with a finger to her rosy lips. A sound of low sobbing came from beyond the yews. The ghost beckoned him close, and he peered through the gap. On the opposite side, an enclosed garden clung to the keep's green-furred walls. Among its browned flower beds, stood an arbor intergnarled with dead wisteria, and underneath it a broken marble bench. There sat the weeper, a woman in a grey-blue dress, curled around something golden in her hands, like a muscle around the grain of sand that causes it such pain. It was the earl's daughter, Colwyn, and from this nearer distance he could see that she was not as young as he'd first thought, or... If she was, then some toll or tragedy had prematurely marked her face, like his, with circles, lines, and other such geometries of care. At the sound of a door suddenly slamming open, she looked up, and then flinched as the voice of Sarkwide filled the garden. How dare you humiliate me like that in front of those scum? Do you want your father to die of shame? I sometimes wonder, Colwyn, I really do, if that isn't secretly what you wish, and if the reason for your mother's early death is not related to these childish displays of yours. This went on for some time. As the old man monologued, the ghost rolled her eyes at Theo and flapped her fingers. Talk, talk, talk. Theo smiled, almost laughed. It felt good to share a moment like this with her again. It had been too long. What's that in your hands? Sarkwide's voice suddenly sharpened. Give it to me. Give it here. It's nothing. Leave it alone. There was a struggle on the other side of the fence, and either the Earl was tougher than he looked, or Colwyn was unwilling to hurt him, for he tore the golden object from her fingers and held it with a clawed white hand, jingling from its chain at arm's length. Bitterness and anger darkened his eyes as he stared at what he held. His frail persona discarded, 
He now seemed strong and cruel. I thought we'd been through this. I tell you, Colwyn, it's over. She is dead by now, and you had better forget it either way. You'll have yourself a husband soon, and likely not a kind one either. Crying over this won't leave him feeling well disposed. He cranked back his arm, and Colwyn gasped with pain as he let the golden object fly. Over here, said the ghost. It was some while later, after Colwyn, dignified and silent, had left her dead garden for the quiet darknesses indoors. Following the ghost's voice, Theo ducked into the stand of shrunken oaks to find her upside down among the rattling brown leaves, as if suspended by clear wires from the clear gray sky. Below her, in the leaf mulch, her carmine glow reflected something gold. What could this possibly be? She sang, always mocking, as he rummaged on all fours in the pile of fallen leaves. It's a locket. Cold and heavy on his fingertips, a gilded pebble of brass with the gold worn thin. Its little chain slithered as he rescued it from the loam. I wonder what could be inside. She reached to the locket with an elegant hand, her fingers passing through. A handsome prince, as I once had, perhaps? As he held it to the afternoon's chill sun, Theo could see the worry marks of Colwyn's fingers on the brass, the first green hints of rust. He flicked a little latch. The locket opened for him with a click. Inside, he found a portrait, rendered in detailed pointwork of the brush. Its subject's strong jaw matched the flush complexion and fine blonde hair worn close-cropped to the scalp. At first, he thought it was a portrait of a man tending toward prettiness. Though, on closer inspection, he thought she was a woman tending more toward the handsome side. Interesting. What do you make of that? But when he turned to the ghost, he found that she was gone, and he was a man alone, crouching in the damp mud beneath a stranger's hedge, with a golden locket in his hand. How much could it be worth? More than a bowl of soup and a crust of bread, for sure. He could be gone and sell it in the next town, and live a couple days of dignity at least. But he could feel the rust marks of worry on the locket's rim, and as he traced their trail with his fingertips, he felt her pain, so very like his own. And so instead of palming the locket, he did a foolish thing. He stepped through the yew hedge and left it, perched atop its coiled chain on the marble bench, like a robin's egg in a bed of golden thatch. He did not see the woman's face watching from an upper window. As he turned to leave, he did not notice Colwyn watching him go. Outside Fencaster's gates, the road split. One muddy track led back through the wilds Theo had crossed to get here. The other ran down around the edges of the fens, toward grey and mud-thatched villages like Sputin and Midgetoke. Both routes wearied him to look at. And so, filled with the same fey and foolish whim that had led him to return the locket, he set out in a third direction, climbing the road's muddy bank to stride through soft loam between the red-barked pines. Here, the high, dark sprays of dark and waxy needles brought some shelter from the hardness of the rain. The red-feathered tree trunks blunted any wind, and the fogs felt warm as batten cotton. His feet sprang from the auburn bed of needles underneath his feet. His heart, for once, felt light. He knew he was acting rashly. In a place like this, the fog might thicken in a minute, and then could last for days or months or never end at all. How many others had set off with a light heart, into the mist and shadow of the dimness fens, never again to return? How many sets of bones were blackening in the bogs? How many sleepless bodies were preserved beneath the still and pine-steeped waters of its sumps and sloughs? What kind of reasonable person would go after them? 
Or what motivates so reckless a course but some unconscious thirst for lonely death? If the ghost were here, she might have something to say about it. If his old friends could only see him. But they were blind these days, their eyes blindfolded now with coral reefs and cockle shells. He was alone in this world, alone through every fault of his own, and if he chose to lose himself in this place of missing things, then there were none to try and find him. Yet strangely, this thought, so often a source of pain and anguish, made him glad. He felt himself completely free, free to take unreasonable risks, to travel routes that others would avoid, to follow intuitions of the heart. From whence this sudden lightness of the soul? A child might have known what caused it, but Theo had made himself too wise for understanding of the clearer kind. And so, though ignorant and cold and hungry still, he smiled to himself as he climbed up shrouded hills, from cedar trunk to cedar trunk, and bounded down their further face to wade chest-deep through flooded creeks and pools, sending slow and supple waves behind him as he softly sang refrains of half-remembered songs from times less cruel. He stopped to catch his breath in a stand of naked birches, and crouched, steaming beneath the red haze of their slender twigs. His songs exhausted, all was silent now, save for the steady drip of water from his joints and hair, tap, tap, tapping to the sodden soil. And then, a small sound, less than the faintest breath of wind, drew his eyes to the fog ahead. He let his hand drop to the pommel at his hip, then froze. The clouds broke a moment in their heavy sky above, and the fog filled up with light, like morning on a frosted window. And there, within the haze and glow, he saw a slender figure, almost inseparable from the light. A white doe, white as autumn rime on the shards of a reaped harvest, with a soft blaze of harvest gold upon her chest. Still as evening water, she watched him, with eyes as dark as pity, and as the light fled, and the fog dimmed around her, he suddenly felt that ancient pain, that arrowhead of heartbreak keen between his ribs as a newly opened wound. Slowly he withdrew his hand from the pommel and extended it toward her. He felt the urgent need to say something, to express some, to share some. But he didn't know. Some kindness, some atonement with this emanation of the woods. But his tongue was dumb as a potsherd, his throat as speechless as a crumbled glyph. For a fleeting, eternal moment they faced each other, man in black and doe in white, and all about them the fog and endless gray gradations. And then she was gone in a sudden flash of silent motion, leaping through the silent, tossing mists, the shadows of the woods, like foam racing on the surface of a silent sea. Wait, was all he managed to whisper in the end. And he felt instantly embarrassed by the inept attempt. It wasn't what he'd meant to say, but he could find no words worthy of what he meant. Maybe there were none. You asked the same of me once. Over his left shoulder, the grave tinged mocking of the ghost. But time and tide wait for no man. Especially not the tide. And the woods behind him filled with cruel, resounding laughter. Following the footsteps of the white doe, or fleeing from the laughter of the ghost, he soon after came upon his first sign of the worm, there was a watercourse between two wooded hills, which endless rains had swollen well beyond its banks. Here, Theo knelt to drink, for night was coming on, and he had sated neither appetite nor thirst since leaving for the castle at first light. 
It was only as he reached for the water with cupped hands that he noticed an iridescent sheen upon its surface and a pungent linger on the air. With one fingertip he reached for the sheen, then hissed, recoiling as its touch scorched him. When he wiped the slick off on his tunic, the fabric bleached. And now that he stood, he could see deep grooves had been carved into the mud of the creek's far bank, gouged by the horns and gnarls of spike along the creature's body. These ripples were like those left in sand by a sidewinder snake, but a hundred times larger. A thousand. Whatever had ripped this mud was thicker in body than a bull, with spines the length of a man's hand, and venom that seeped from its pores to taint whatever earth or water that it touched. As he studied these marks in the fading light, a clump of the far bank collapsed, and he realized with horror that with mud this soft, such crisp tracks could only mean the trail was merely minutes old. And as if in response to this thought, the dimming air was split to pieces by a wailing howl. It was a sound unlike anything he had ever heard before. The crocodile's hiss was in it, but also the roaring of bulls and tigers and something else. An almost human sorrow, like the funereal screaming of women at the barbarian pyre of some slaughtered youth. To Theo, standing in half-darkness, the sound was full of dread and heartbreak both. But it was also the sound of his prey. Now that the quarry was near at hand, his body remembered how long it had been since he had eaten. The hunger made him game and ruthless, like he had learned to be as a young man raised to violence on a Viking-haunted coast. And so he buried his feelings deep, and bared his teeth, and drew his sword and set out down along the water's edge, searching for his kill. How near or distant had the howling been? The waxing fog made it difficult to tell. It could muffle footsteps at a dozen paces, could magnify a whisper at quarter mile. But there was that scent on the air, that scent of the sheen on the water, a feculent chemical tang, like spilled sewage half-cleaned by strong astrogents. It had to be the creature's scent, and so he followed it, bounded down the bank, leaping moldering logs, ducking the slanted lengths of winter-broken birches, making the dry ferns whisper with his long strides. That howling cry broke upon the sinking sky a second time, and he knew, with bitter certainty, that this time it was close. He burst through the rim of trees, and found himself on the brink of vast, dark water so quickly that he almost tumbled in. The fens had opened up before him, an icy flood, black pricked by shattered reeds, and reaching endless for the rim of fading silver nightfall's edge. Across this flat, black water spread a slow trigonometry of rippling wake, left by the movement of some huge creature out of sight. Curls of oily residue spun slowly on these dying waves, merging and breaking like clouds of starlings on the evening wind. But of the lathworm itself, he saw nothing. It had eluded him for now, and gone to places where he dare not follow. By steady drips, he felt his hunter's bloodthirst drain away, leaving him empty and weak. When he turned back to the woods, he found that they were dark, as inevitable, as imperceptible as death. The night had come. An ebbing blueness in the sky was all the light that he had left. He was tired and cold and had no place to rest. This way. The voice of the ghost at night was plum and sable, and when he turned to see her, on his left, she was a rose effulgence in the blackened woods. More than in the day, her naked skull showed through, and when the cold night breeze blew through her, it brought the sense of brine and bloated bodies on the shore. This way, she said again, i found a place for you to rest. <sighs> How do I know? He said, suddenly unsettled by her. How do I know that I can trust you? That you won't lead me to some 
cold, black drowning pool in the dark. To the same fate. The same fate I... She was suddenly right before him, with a finger to his lips, and though her touch was insubstantial, he let himself be silenced. I do not hate you, was all she said. He wished he could believe her. This special series, The Hunting of the Lathe Worm, was written by Alexander Saxton and is performed by Anthony Botello. The Wrong Station is made possible with the generous support of our listeners on Patreon. Thank you to Daryl Stubbs, Austin Johnson, Emily Janning, and Anurin Cannon Klein for helping us keep the lights, well, off. You can also support us by leaving a rating and review on iTunes or wherever it is you listen to The Wrong Station. The Wrong Station is co-produced by Alexander Saxton, Anthony Botello, and Jacob Duarte Spiel, with music composed and performed on the piano by Elan Citrin, and arranged for the viola and performed by Viola Schmidt. You can follow The Wrong Station on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and email us at therongstation at gmail.com. And until next time, thank you for listening. <laughs>